Berlin Hauptbahnhof, uh, that is Berlin's central trade station. Um, looks massive. And I'm about to get on a train to go to Bonn because, as I've told you before, at this moment my husband works in Berlin and is going to keep, keep working here while I'm doing my masters in Cologne. <laughs> But hopefully, this is the last semester that I have to do that. I mean, last semester, my husband has had to travel between Berlin and Bonn every weekend. This semester, I'm doing it. Der Deutsche Bahn, which is the German train service, the only train service, well, the main train service, um, is notorious for, for their trains being delayed or cancelled. Um, and... Um, yeah, this was, I mean, you're supposed to experience some culture shock when you arrive in a new country, right? At least that's what they say. I wouldn't say I experienced a lot of shock because uh, I was already familiar with, um, well, at least with the Western European uh, culture in general, if not with the German culture in particular. Uh, but one thing I was I was really taken aback with, I was really surprised to, um, to see was that uh, German trains were not punctual at all. I don't know where I took this stereotype from that Germans or uh, at least German trains should be punctual so well they are for the most part not although it does get better during the low season so now it is the low season so hopefully everything uh, goes well and we arrive on time uh, but during the high season yeah it's pretty bad Berlin Central Station is a gigantic four or five storied structure which you need a few visits to before you're able to find your way around it the way from Berlin to Bonn, where I live, takes me seven to eight hours door to door, so I've decided to stop off at an Asian fast food restaurant to have dinner. I'm so happy that although I'm a student, it's not that miserable experience I had when I was doing my bachelor's when there was no way I could afford eating out, even at a fast food place. Hi, um, so I'm at my place in Bonn already, I arrived yesterday, today's Tuesday, um, the lectures for me don't start till tomorrow, so um, this has been a free day uh, when I've run a few errands in the city, did some shopping, nothing serious, just bought some food and some essentials that I was running out of, like toilet paper, um, I been to the gym today, I've done the laundry, uh, yeah, that kind of stuff. Uh, the weather is amazing today, it's sunny, a little bit chilly, but that's fine. Um, I'm going to the university tomorrow and hopefully I won't forget to film a few videos at the campus to show you what it looks like. So yeah, see you then. Welcome to Bonn. My personal experience of this city has been that it's a mix of being a reasonable size with quite a lot of jobs and entertainment options, but also very laid back, especially along the Rhine River where there's a promenade, also in some places like Zutstadt or the city centre. You get these holiday vibes. Everyone is chilled and not really rushing anywhere, and I like it. I've just realised that I think I need to explain something because many of you might not know, like, why am I in Bonn? So my husband lives in Berlin because he has a job there. I am studying at a university in Cologne. Uh, Cologne is not very far from Bonn and uh, I couldn't find an apartment in Cologne. So that's why I live in Bonn. And the thing is that, you know, I, I started studying at the University of Cologne before my husband found a job 
in, in, in Germany because we came here together. He was looking for a job. And um, so I, I first chose the university. I started studying there and then, then he found a job. And um, one of the jobs he was offered was in Berlin. And like that was the best of all the jobs that he was offered. And so, you know, it's not easy to emigrate. You cannot, uh, uh, you, you sometimes have to trade something off, right? Um, it cannot be perfect. Um, in, you know, 99.9% .9 of cases, immigration is not easy. So we thought, you know, the conditions um, the salary at that job were really good, so we decided that he would accept. And now I have to travel between Berlin and Bonn um, until I finish my master's degree, which I'm trying to do as quickly as possible. The campus of the University of Cologne is huge. It sometimes takes me 20 minutes to walk from one building to another. It's not very impressive or beautiful, even though it's a really old university, because most of Cologne was destroyed in the Second World War. I think if I sit here for a little bit longer, I might get sunburned. Um, so I'm going to record this video and then go somewhere else. So I've already had, uh, I'm, I'm at the campus and I've already had one um, seminar today. Then we went for a walk with a friend of mine, a friend from the university, um, just walked around and and now I'm waiting for the second seminar of today and I've got two hours left till the next seminar and I'm just sitting here on the grass trying to come up with ideas about what I could do. <laughs> Going home is not an option. Um, as I've said before, I commute every day from Bonn to Cologne and it takes me one hour to go to university or to go home one way so there's no point going home now so I guess I'll go to the canteen um, and grab a tea or something just yeah get something to drink um, I've got a book with me so maybe we'll read a book yeah <laughs> I don't always have time to cook, so sometimes it just has to be a prepackaged meal from the supermarket. In this case, it's a cold pasta salad. Hi, I've just come home from the gym, that's why my hair is wet. Uh, I usually try to go three or four times a week. I usually only manage three. And now that I'm traveling between Bonn and Berlin all the time and with the studies, um, I'm not sure how many times a week I'm gonna manage. Um, I've only been two times this week. We'll see. But what I wanted to share with you is that what else happened today is that I received this hoodie, um, got it delivered today. It's by a German brand, Mela. And this is not a paid promotion. I don't do paid promotions uh, because I can't. I, I legally can't because I'm getting a scholarship. I've told you before, so I cannot uh, work. Oh, well, I could, but it would be just a bureaucratic nightmare, so <laughs> I've decided not to. So this is not a paid promotion. Um, I was just looking online for a hoodie by Sustainable Brand. That was important to me. I was trying to find a nice looking <laughs> hoodie by Sustainable Brand. So uh, if you don't know, a sustainable uh, brand is the exact opposite of a fast fashion brand. So fast fashion brands, they, um, they, uh, they don't usually care uh, where they source their materials. Um, so where their materials come from and how they're produced. Uh, they don't usually care very much about um, 
who makes the clothes. So uh, they very often make their clothes, produce their clothes in sweatshops, sweatshops somewhere, you know, in Southeast Eastern Asia. Uh, a sweatshop is a very like a huge factory where lots of workers work very long hours for very low wages. Um, sustainable brands, on the contrary, uh, they, you know, they, they do care where they source their materials. In this case, it's cotton. Um, they always try to be uh, respond so that they are responsible brands. They um, always try to make sure that the people that make these clothes that they that they get fairly paid um, and uh, they don't usually change collections very often that's uh, you know one of the signs of how you can know if the brand is sustainable or it is fast fashion because you know fast fashion brands like H&M and, and the like um, you see new collections coming out all the time uh, but you can just you know google for sustainable brands and uh, the problem with with them is that they're often very expensive uh, this one is not too expensive and another thing is that I was looking for a hoodie of you know a nice color because many of them are just black and um, I don't know just other colors that are too boring or don't suit me and this purple I really liked it's really nice and I think it suit, suits me um, so yeah I'm um, Quite happy with it. I usually have what I'd call a hearty breakfast, don't know what you'd call it. This semester I've got all of my seminars packed in three days, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. It's hard but it also means I can spend the whole weekend in Berlin and that's where I'm headed. And I'm in front of Berlin Central Station again. I'm back in Berlin. I'm waiting for my husband to pick me up in his car. It's a company car which we're very lucky to have. Uh, it's raining, um, typical Berlin, I guess, um, but it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> There's an Easter market down the street and there are lots of people strolling around, enjoying themselves and making our neighbourhood too crowded and it might sound like an old lady now, but so be it. Whatever you call them, pancakes or crepes or, well, they're actually Slavic blini is one of my favourite foods. I could eat them every day. Saturday, the weather's really nice. Uh, we've just gone for a walk with my husband and went to shopping mall and we got this. Uh, these are eggs inside in a chocolate eggshell, half a chocolate eggshell, because we've been invited to an Easter brunch tomorrow on Sunday. Um, my husband's sister has been living in Berlin for about, I don't know, maybe eight years now. and. A friend of hers has invited her and us to this brunch. Um, luckily, those are going to be Belarusians, Ukrainians and Russians there. So uh, there'll be no need to speak German, uh, which I can speak. I do speak when I have to. But, uh, you know, sometimes I just feel lazy. It just feels a bit, you know, too much for a Sunday morning sometimes um so i think it's gonna be a pretty laid back um uh, easter party <laughs> morning party yeah speaking of german um i've i haven't had much time to learn it this week because this has been the first week of Back to university. Um, so I want to show you what I've been doing this week at least because these are just some of the things that I that I do and that I have been doing recently uh, because I do lots of different stuff. One of the things is reading this magazine. Um, I can really recommend it. I, I just I swear by it. It's uh, I, I love it. 
Um, so it's called, um, no, it, it, it's the publishing house is called uh, Zeitsprachen. Um, it's like part of the bigger publishing house site. They've also got a newspaper. Um, and this is just a random issue, just picked it from the shelf. Uh, not the latest issue of the magazine, but I'm subscribed to this magazine and I get it um, in my mail every week, sorry, every month. Um, yeah, so what I like about it is that firstly, it, it actually looks like, like, like a real, like a real magazine, you know, and um, it's got articles which cover different, you know, current topics, like the hot top, the topics that are hot right now in Germany. So basically those are the same topics um, that the, I th that I think would be covered in the Zeit uh, newspaper. Um, I mean, the non-adapted one. But here the texts are adapted to three levels. Um, they also underline some words. I don't know if you can see it. So they you know, underline some words and give their definitions in really simple language next to every article. Uh, that's great. There's also an additional exercise book with um, vocabulary and grammar exercises. And there's a CD. I know, a CD, but that's Germany. You know if you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can order an additional digital version of the CD, which I do as well. Uh, yeah, a CD with really nice recordings. Uh, this is a, um, you know, a liberal left-wing um, kind of publication, um, if you need to know that, because you might not like it if you are more right-wing, because they are pro-immigration, you know, uh, pro-homosexual, couples and stuff like that uh which i'm pro as well uh yeah what else yeah so i've been doing that and yeah uh last august i did august and september i did a german course at language school um at a, yeah a language school here in germany and we were given access uh, to two textbooks for a year. And what I'm doing, I'm just redoing the exercises from those textbooks. Uh, that is B1 level. I did B1 um, then in August and September. And it might seem really slow, like why I'm still doing B1 if I did it, you know, in August and September. But firstly, as, as a foreign language teacher, I know that B1, it's, it's massive. Um, so, and it, it lays the foundation for B2 and C1, and I'm not in a rush, um, so why not, why not master B1 very well first before moving on to B2, if I'm not in a rush, do you know what I mean? And uh, I'm also really enjoying this level because there, there's lots of everyday vocabulary and everyday grammar in this language, something that I find that I hear all the time, like every day. Um, and this is the level that you can actually survive in a foreign country with. Um, so yeah, nothing, there's nothing wrong with staying at B1 for longer. I want you to know that there's nothing wrong with that. So a few days ago, I received a comment saying, what do you study in your program? And I was like, huh, did I ever tell you? I mean, some of you might know that I do, um, that I study linguistics, that I'm doing a master's degree in linguistics. But if you're not a linguist yourself, then how can you possibly know what exactly sorry that was the cat 
<laughs> what exactly um, it is that I study. And so I decided to tell you what it is. Linguistics um, as a discipline can be subdivided into several fields, several subfields. There are people, for example, who do language documentation. Those are people who work, linguists who work with um, languages, endangered languages that might go extinct at some point in the near future. And what they're trying to do, are, so endangered languages are usually those languages that there are just a few speakers left or a few dozens of speakers left or a few hundreds. And linguists are trying to document those languages, to write them down, to collect as much information as they can, uh, as much data as they can about these languages um, before these languages die out. It's kind of like writing down the, like preserving the DNA of a bird species that is going to, that is dying out. Um, and maybe, you know, in the hope of somehow bringing it back to life in the future. And languages can be brought back to life. They can be revitalized. There are also linguists who are, work in computational linguistics. There are definitely, I mean, I don't know, but there must be linguists working on ChatGPT in OpenAI, or for example, linguists working on Google Translate or voice to speech to text, um, so voice recognition in smartphones, for example. Um, and uh, so, and uh, for, uh, there are linguists who work in multilingualism, there are linguists who work in language acquisition, there are many, many, many subfields. Um, those that I've named are just a few, just to give you a picture, just to give you an idea of um, what, like, I mean, what kind of things a person can do in linguistics multilingualism and language acquisition, primarily second language acquisition, because I'm a teacher of English as a foreign language, but also first language acquisition. Acquisition is not exactly the same. I mean, it's not the same as teaching because uh, you can acquire a language without um, a teacher, right? For example, if you're a native speaker or even a second language, a foreign language, you can acquire it without um, you know, studying or learning with a teacher, but still the questions of language acquisition and language learning are closely related. And yeah, exactly. I, I decided, you know, to follow this path uh, because I wanted to study something that would be as closely related as possible to, to language teaching. And so it is multilingualism yeah, and language acquisition. Uh, and I'm, I'm really fascinated with what we're doing. Uh, uh, this semester, for example, no, okay, I should, I should start with this. Uh, now, in language acquisition, there are, again, two kind of sub-fields of linguistics that are involved. Those are psycholinguistics and sociolinguistics. Psycholinguistics is... Um, the field, the subfield of linguistics that, um, uh, that is concerned with uh, defining the ways in which our brain stores and processes language knowledge. Um, so basically, how do we learn a language? Like how does an individual brain of a specific speaker learn a language, a native language or any other language? Um, how we forget a language and why we forget a language, how if we are bilingual, for example, how different languages maybe interact in our brain. And so this is psycholinguistics. Uh, they, uh, it has um, a lot of links with neurosciences um, and like the methods are very often the same, like they also use MRI or ERP, uh, or other techniques that are also used in neurosciences. And uh, psycholinguistics is kind of like the foundation block 
for um, so in, in this subfield of language acquisition and language learning, sociolinguistics kind of builds up on that. Uh, sociolinguistics is concerned with, um, with how we use languages, like how languages work in a society at large or uh, in a specific community. Sociolinguistics is about, yeah, it's about the society, it's about politics, it's about traditions, uh, it's about some, you know, preconceptions that we have about, in this case, language learning, but also about other things in, in uh, related to languages. Um, and for example, this semester, we are talking a lot about the monolingual bias. Now, what is a monolingual bias? Yeah, I should first say that, uh, so you, you probably, you have probably heard about yeah, monolinguals and bilinguals or multilinguals, um, multilingual, monolinguals, multilinguals. <laughs> yeah, um, and for a long time, for centuries, it has been believed that a monolingual person is the norm, while the a bilingual or a multilingual person is an exception. And it, it, it has also been believed, it is still believed in, in many countries and cultures, that a bilingual, like a perfect, quote unquote perfect bilingual, uh, should be like a combination of two monolinguals in one brain like we take you know two brains of two monolinguals and put it in one brain and this is what um a perfect or the so-called balanced uh bilingual should be like uh but the like a lot of recent research has shown uh so a lot of research in sociolinguistics firstly has shown that um, this is not the case uh, that the monolingual person is the norm and the bilingual person is the exception because if we take all the or most of the communities all over the world it turns out that multilingualism is actually the norm so most people in the world actually speak two or more languages and it's it's the minority that speak uh, just one language so Speaking one language is an exception. Okay, that's one thing. Um, and then, then there's the question like, why do we then think that an, again, quote unquote, normal or perfect bilingual should be two monolinguals in one, if a monolingual is not even the norm? And psycholinguistics has shown as well that that's not how our brain um, functions. It does not store the two languages that it knows or more languages that it knows in separate boxes, you know. Mm, no, it's, it's not, you know, several separate systems of languages that we have in our brain. We, like we bilinguals, multilingual, multilinguals. I don't know why I'm having trouble to, you know, pronouncing this word. Uh, anyway, yeah. So it, it's not actually the case. Mm, all the languages that we know get integrated into one system. This is what psycholinguistics has been showing recently. And they're integrated into one system and that's why things like code switching or code mixing or the modern term translanguaging happen. That's for example when you, um, you know, or when you're trying to say something uh, and then, you know, words from three different languages pop up and you just, you can't do anything about it and you construct an utterance that um, consists of words and grammar also and maybe phonological features. Uh, so that's how words are pronounced from three different languages. Uh, and that's fine. That's actually the norm. That's how the brain functions when it has, when it faces this necessity to maintain several languages, two or more languages. So this is the norm. 
and, uh, and they're the monolingual bias. So uh, thinking that monolingualism is the norm is basically the monolingual bias. What's the problem with it, right? This is the question. Why am I telling you that? I'll give you an example. In uh, Germany, um, even today, like nowadays, a lot of children get diagnosed with speech deficiencies. In, in German, yeah, of course, because doctors talk to them in German, and they're diagnosed with speech deficiencies because their German is worse than that of their peers, so than that of the other children their age. But then it turns out that actually many of these children, okay, not all of them, of course, but many of these children are just bilinguals or multilinguals who speak one language at home and, well, if they do go to kindergarten, then, yeah, they probably need to speak German there, but they speak another language at home. And what often happens is that, yeah, maybe their home language is just more developed, is the dominant language. And their German, yeah, it is worse. And so maybe that, or maybe even if their ger German is not, you know, maybe it, even if their German is the dominant language, um, bilingual children, not all of them, but many of them do indeed take longer uh, to become functional or let's say no to so the uh, the proficiency in the language that they speak takes longer to develop and this doesn't mean that you know when they get older they will become the, 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 it doesn't mean that they won't become fully functional in all the languages that they speak it just yeah sometimes it just takes longer for bilinguals uh, and again that's fine that's that's the norm but some doctors just because they don't know that they don't know some of them don't know the results of some of the psycholinguistic studies or sociolinguistic studies in linguistics um they they think that those children have some problems with uh with speech with speech in general and diagnose them with speech deficiencies I hope you see the problem. Um, and yeah, I, I do find it really fascinating. I find it really useful. Both, so, you know, irrespective of what I'm gonna do after university, I, if I do something in science, I will be able to contribute. But even if I don't, I understand that if I broaden my horizons in this way, if I, um, you know, just discover all of these things just for myself, then I would be able to change my mindset and to maybe t change the way I work, uh, wherever I'm gonna work. If you find this as fascinating as I do, then let me know in the comments and I may make another video, like a whole video about bilingualism, multilingualism, monolingualism. Um, yeah, let me know. This is literally one of the best things that has ever happened to me in my life. Is it warm? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, it is. Enjoying yourself here. We brought him here to Germany from Belarus. He was a stray cat. <laughs> Look at this creature. He was a stray cat at my husband's work. Um, my husband, when my husband worked at a construction site in Belarus, he was just a small stray kitten. And I'd wanted a cat all my life. And we decided to take him home. And this was, oh no, 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 no. Censored. <laughs> hey, stop, stop. That's enough.